My name is Brandon Hayslatton. I'm a medical oncologist and I'm the senior medical advisor to Livestrong. I was asked to give you some of my thoughts on the recent statement of the World Health Organization uh, relating the risk of uh, cancer to cell phones. Uh, overall, uh, I feel like there is no reason to uh, be alarmed uh, that in fact this is a chance for us to remember that there is a very solid uh, base of knowledge around cancer risk factors that's not preliminary and not controversial at all. Uh, and that we should take information about the risk of cancer and present it in the context of the magnitude of the risk uh, so that we know how to react to stories like this. So on Tuesday, the World Health Organization and their International Agency for Research on Cancer released a statement that classified the electromagnetic fields associated with cell phone uses as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Uh, that's a category of possible meaning that the link between a given uh, exposure like cell phones and the risk of cancer has not been ruled out and is worthy, worthy of further study. This is based on findings for the potential increase of a brain tumor called glioma uh, uh, in association with uh, wireless cell phone use. So let's take a closer look at this. The World Health Organization is very cautious when it analyzes these uh, recommendations and in fact out of the hundreds and hundreds of compounds and exposures uh, that they have analyzed, to date they've only listed one agent as so safe as to be labeled as probably not carcinogenic. Uh, that's a compound that's used as a raw material in the production of nylon fiber. If you look at the category of possible carcinogens that they recommended cell phone use uh, uh, be included, you'll find things like coffee, pickled vegetables, Potassium bromate, which is one of the main ingredients in most flour and bread products sold in the United States. And acetaldehyde, which occurs naturally in coffee and bread and ripe fruit and is produced by plants as part of their normal metabolism. I'm even more concerned when I look at the study that led to the recommendation of the World Health Organization uh, that was published here. If you read this uh, finding, uh, uh, of the study Intrafone carefully, overall what you find is the opposite. Uh, their results show that in fact the use of cell phones decreased, not increased, the risk of brain tumors including gliomas uh, by about 29 percent when you looked at those pay, uh, uh, subjects who had ever been regular users of cell phones versus people who had never been a regular user of cell phones. Uh, when looking at the study on whole, the authors report that uh, that finding must be from flawed uh, methods. They say, quote, an apparently decreased risk of brain tumors with ever regular use of mobile phone relative to never regular use has been seen in other studies. Putting aside a genuine protective effect as implausible, we have considered other reasons for these observations. So really what they're saying here is that's implausible. We don't believe that the regular use of cell phones actually protects against brain cancer. And they list several reasons that the study might be flawed, including the way that um, controls were sampled. So how do you find patients who had never had brain cancer to be normal controls? And is your sampling of that bias? One example is the level of participation of people who were approached to be controls was only 53%. They also note that um, the types of people who are regular users of cell phone uh, probably are from a higher socioeconomic status, and so a lot of their other exposures may be confounding the results of cell phone use. Finally, the methods that they used for determining the amount of cell phone use in brain cancer survivors versus controls was essentially a survey to recall or to remember how much cell phone use and that's also a risk for bias because people who have had cancer often think back to exposures that, um, that they're concerned about. So if the overall findings of the study was actually a decrease in brain tumors, why are we reading this uh, report in the media this week? Well, when they took a look at the brain tumor glioma and they took a look at subjects and categorized the degree of cell phone use from little cell phone use to the very highest, 
uh, they took 10 categories and found that in the highest cell phone use category, uh, the uh, subjects who reported over 1,640 hours of talk time, some of whom reported over 12 hours of talk a day, in that highest risk category, they found that there was a 40% increase uh, in the risk of glioma. Again, if you look at the statistical analysis, that estimation is quite broad. And in fact, the risk that they found in their study may be as small as only a 3% risk. They also ch categorize cell phone use, not just by the time, uh, talk time on a cell phone, but the number of phone calls. And even in the highest of those 10 categories, there was no increased risk of glioma or other brain cancer seen. So again, the report and statement from the World Health Organization uh, that there is still a possibility that cell phone use may, may be related to cancer uh, is preliminary. Uh, it requires more study, and at this time is really no reason for alarm. It's important for us to take a look at uh, this report in the context of what we know about cancer risk and to remember that there really is a very solid evidence base around things that we know are risk factors for cancer, reports that are not preliminary and not controversial at all. In fact, the World Health Organization has classified 107 agents to be known carcinogens, including many of the things that we have control over exposure. Things like tobacco, whether it's smoking tobacco, secondhand smoke, or smokeless tobacco. Sunlight exposure, various chemicals, including drinking alcohol. And radiation exposures, including common household exposures like the colorless and odorless gas radon, uh, that is in fact the most significant source of human exposure to radiation from a natural source. So we need to take a look at these known carcinogens and how we can look at the uh, degree of risk and how we can modify our behavior to lessen our own cancer risk. So what do we know about the magnitude of risk of cancer? So overall there's about 2.4 million deaths in the United States per year and cancer is the leading cause of death with about 569,000 deaths per year. If we look at tobacco use its exposure is probably responsible for about 180,000 cancer deaths per year in the United States. And even the less uh, known exposure of radon gas is probably responsible for somewhere between 15 and 22,000 cancer deaths per year. That's actually more cancer deaths than all brain cancer deaths in the United States combined. And what do we know about cell phones? In addition to cancer risk, we're all aware that cell phones uh, uh, can increase the risk of driving accidents and, in fact, driving deaths. The magnitude of that risk, cell phone-associated driving deaths, is about 2,600 deaths per year. So overall, if we're going to consider cancer in risks, we should focus a lot more attention on tobacco exposure, radon exposure, sunlight, chemicals, even diet, health, uh, exercise and body weight as known, not controversial risk factors and things that we can control. We have to be careful about how we react to new information about cancer risks. Just because uh, a new finding makes it to the front lines of the newspaper doesn't mean it's the most important cancer risk. And we need to take this time to uh, remind ourselves of the solid knowledge base we have about preventing cancer and focus on new ways to change the behavior that can lessen those risks. Thank you and live strong.